Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, project manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will go over PEP to PREP transitions, evidence and innovations. I would like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Douglas Krakauer from the Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Krakauer. Thank you very much, Jose. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank all the participants for joining and for sending in their really outstanding questions in advance. And hopefully we'll address many of those during the presentation and also in the Q&A afterwards. In terms of some important information as we start the webinar, um, there is CME provided and the IES USA designates this live activity for a maximum of 1.25 CME credits. The webinar is also approved for 1.25 hours of nursing, pharmacy, and pharmacotherapy credits. And evaluations and CME certificates will be available in your IS USA My Activities page by five o'clock Pacific time tomorrow. We wanna thank our contributors who have generously supported this webinar as listed here on this slide. And in terms of some important issues to navigate the webinar, um, a separate window will show the poll questions that come up throughout the webinar. Please choose your responses from the poll um, and responses will be delayed after the poll closes. To submit questions, please use the Q&A button and you need to include your first and last name in order to have your questions addressed. And in general, most of the questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar and we apologize in advance if we're not able to address all the questions. We already have an outstanding array of questions that have come in uh, from the pre-testing, uh, sorry, the pre-webinar uh, solicitations. So here's the first poll. From which geographic region are you viewing this webinar? The West or the Midwest United States, the South or Southeast US, the Northeast, Canada, Mexico, Central or South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, or another? Okay, great. So I see the answers coming in. We have about a third from the West or the Midwest, 29% from the South or Southeast, and 31% from the Northeast, and then a small number from Mexico, Central South America, and pretty much all over the world, which is really exciting. So welcome everyone. Okay, for the second poll, please rate your level of experience in the medical management of HIV infection where one would be a novice level and five would be an expert level. All right, so the numbers are in. We have a great array from a quarter novice, 18% sort of number two, 28% number three, 26% number four, and then a smattering of experts as well. So this is gonna be a, a great discussion that hopefully covers information useful for everyone who is uh, on the spectrum from novice to expert and everything in between. Okay, so let's advance. Okay, great. So that concludes the sort of front matter for the talk. And now we're gonna dive into the core of the presentation, PEP to PrEP transitions, evidence and innovations. See, I'm trying to advance the slides here. Okay, great, learning objectives. So on the completion of this webinar, uh, learners will be able to 
do the following. Summarize the available data on recent trends in post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP use, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP use. Summarize the scientific evidence and clinical guidelines on approaches for transitioning from PEP to PrEP, and then describe innovative approaches to transitions from PEP to PrEP. All right, so let's start with a pre-test question. Number one, what do clinical practice guidelines from the US CDC recommend for the PEP to PrEP transition? Do they recommend that people complete PEP, wait six months to confirm that someone has an HIV uninfected status, and then start PrEP? Do they recommend completing PEP, then waiting three months to confirm that they have an HIV uninfected status, and then start PrEP? Is the recommendation complete PEP, confirm HIV uninfected status, and then go right into PrEP without delay? Or do they not specifically address the PEP to PrEP transition in the guidelines? Please answer now, thank you. And we'll be discussing uh, during the presentation, the information that's in these two pre-test questions that we'll be doing now. Okay, great, let's move on to the next pre-test question. Okay, question number two. Which innovative approach to PEP has been studied in routine care settings? Long acting injectable PEP, PEP in pocket, which is prescribing a PEP course for patients who can then self-administer the PEP after potential exposure, a single dose of a long acting oral PrEP agent or infusion of monoclonal antibodies against HIV as PEP. Please answer now. Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna jump into the exciting heart of the presentation here, starting with PEP. And uh, we're gonna talk about PEP and PrEP. And PEP has been around a long time, 25 years plus at this point. And PrEP is relatively newer, but has gotten a lot more attention. And there's a huge evidence base for PrEP and less so for PEP. And I thought this was uh, really nicely put by a session at Croy in 2015 about PEP called PEP, Remember Me. But we're going to give PEP the attention that is well-deserved as the first uh, and still a very important aspect of chemoprophylaxis for HIV prevention. So the very first evidence showing that PEP was likely to be efficacious at preventing HIV acquisition was from an observational case control study from 1997. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. So again, almost a quarter century of PEP information. This is probably the biggest and best study looking at the efficacy of um, PEP. And this was a study of healthcare workers who had occupational percutaneous exposures to HIV infected blood as part of their work. And they looked at 33 cases of healthcare workers who acquired HIV at work versus 665 controls who did not. And factors that were um, factors predicting the risk of an actual transmission event were a deep injury, having visible blood on a device, a procedure involving a needle in an artery or vein, or a terminal illness in the source patient with HIV. These are probably all proxies for a higher aliquot of blood and more virus being transmitted as part of the exposure, which we now know is something that correlates with HIV transmission. The only thing that was protective were if people used 28 days of PEP with Zidovudine or AZT, one of the first antiretrovirals, and that reduced the odds of HIV transmission in the case control study by over 80%. So there probably will never be a randomized controlled trial of PEP at this point um, in the sense of people getting a placebo because it wouldn't be considered ethical, but these data stand the test of time and they started the whole field of chemoprophylaxis. In terms of trends in PEP use, we know that PEP is greatly underused all around the world. And so we need to think about ways to improve PEP implementation. This is a recent study that was a meta-analysis of over 30 studies looking at PrEP use in different regions of the country and over different time periods. And as you can see from the um, bar that I have in red at the top of the graph here, 
In terms of the WHO region, the region of the Americas where most of the participants today are sitting here in the US, when they looked at 14 studies covering over 23,000 MSM over many decades, only about 4.5% had ever used PEP. So this goes to show that in a population like MSM where there are high incidence rates in terms of HIV acquisition and it's a group that has a disproportionate burden of new infections, not just in the US, but also around the world, we really need to think about better implementation of PEP. If you go to the bottom uh, red rectangle, you can see that overall globally, only 6% of MSM have ever used PEP. So more intensive efforts at implementation are really going to be important. Okay, jumping into the first audience response question for you to consider. 22 year old cisgender woman presents for PEP after a sexual assault. She has no medical conditions and takes no medications. Which PEP regimen would you recommend? Would you recommend tenofovir, disoproxyl fumarate plus emtricitabine or TDF-FTC plus raltegravir as a third agent? Would you do TDF-FTC plus dolutegravir? Would you do TDF-FTC plus boosted gerunavir? Or would you use tenofovir alafenamide with emtricitabine or TAF-FTC plus raltegravir or TAF-FTC plus dolutegravir or another regimen? Please enter your votes now. Okay, very excited to see what comes in here on the, on the polling. Okay, so we have about 30% said TDF, FTC plus raltegravir, another 40% TDF plus dolutegravir. And that, those are the dominant answers. Some people also um, ticked off all the other options. So it's good that we're having this conversation because there isn't quite consensus. So in terms of the um, CDC guidelines, which we'll talk about in a little more depth after this, they recommend TDF-FTC in terms of PEP as the only um, uh, major agent as first line that they recommend. There's been uh, really no chemoprophylaxis studies as PEP with TAF-FTC uh, with raltegravir or dolutegravir yet, although we'll talk about some investigational studies looking at that now. So as of now, four and five wouldn't be options that are consistent with the CDC guidelines. Amongst the options one, two, and three, the guidelines recommend integrase inhibitors because of their tolerability and very few drug interactions. So options one and two are, are what would be most consistent with the most recent PEP guidelines. Although there isn't any strong evidence to suggest that one regimen is better than others because there haven't been comparative studies. So in fact, there are probably a lot of options with TDF-FTC and these third agents that are totally reasonable, even though the CDC guidelines would recommend one or two. And we'll talk a little bit more about the nuance of this case that we're talking about a cisgender woman who has the potential to become pregnant in just a moment, which is key to this case because of some signals that dolutegravir has been known to cause increased risk of neural tube defects in women living with HIV. So here's a snapshot of uh, kind of a compilation of the CDC guidelines for non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis and occupational PEP. And uh, the punchline here is that TDF-FTC is well tolerated. And even though there are rare cases of nephrotoxicity, it's generally very, very safe. And so that's the recommended backbone. And then the preferred uh, third agent is either dolutegravir or raltegravir. And I've put in red dolutegravir because it's one tab daily versus one tab BOD for raltegravir, although there now is two tabs once daily dosing that can also be used. But for that reason, dolutegravir is the, probably the simplest regimen, but they do leave room for a whole host of different alternatives that people can use, including boosted protease inhibitors, other NRTIs as alternatives, or even at the bottom, you can see there's a single tablet regimen, regimen that they included in their guidelines, TDF, FTC, and LITegravir, cobacistat. So lots of options. So why the focus on having a cisgender woman who is of childbearing potential in the case? Well, um, in Botswana, there were some large studies looking at women living with HIV who became pregnant while using dolutegravir. And um, in these studies, they found an increased risk of neural tube defects in that um, case. So the CDC in 2018 put out a, a guidance statement about the implications of this finding for HIV PEP. And what they say in the statement is that healthcare providers prescribing PEP should avoid the use of dolutegravir for non-pregnant women of childbearing potential who are sexually active or have been sexually assaulted and who are not using an effective birth control method and pregnant women early in pregnancy since the risk 
of an unborn infant having a neural tube defect is highest during the first 28 days before closure of the neural tube. So they recommend for women such as the cisgender woman in the case that the preferred PrEP, PrEP regimen be raltegravir, tenofovir, and amtricitabine. And so that was the um, standing in 2018, which caused a lot of kerfuffle as um, people had to kind of switch from using dolutegravir to thinking about raltegravir in people who had become pregnant, but then maybe use dolutegravir in other populations. So things got a little bit complicated. Okay, but there's some good news here. There are some updated results from those studies in Botswana. The studies are called the Sipamo studies where they looked at women living with HIV who had dolutegravir at the time of conception. And you can see in the left upper corner of the graph, there's 0.94 written in red. That's the percentage of women who had dolutegravir um, at, uh, in pregnancy and conceived while, while using dolutegravir who had a neural tube defect. So 0.94% is almost 1% one in one in, or one in 100. Those were the data that were concerning to WHO and CDC and made them put out statements such as the PEP statement I just read before. But in more recent time, the same group that published those data have showed that with more follow-up, they actually had lower um, rates of neural tube de defects. And in 2019, they um, published that the rate had actually gone down to 0.3%. And then at the AIDS conference this summer, the rate was even lower and seeming to stabilize. And the other estimates on the screen here, if you look all the way to the right, where it's 0.08%, that's actually the rate in HIV negative people. And so the rate has actually gone closer and closer to what you find in people on other regimens at the time of conception or even uh, women who are HIV negative. So it's much more reassuring. And in fact, in 2019, based on these reassuring data, WHO actually recommended dolutegravir as a preferred HIV treatment option in all populations, including women of childbearing potential. And so many of us took this recommendation and the improved data as a sign that using dolutegravir as PEP is probably um, even safer than using it for HIV treatment because the course is likely to be shorter. PEP is only 28 days versus an indefinite course with dolutegravir for um, people who are going to be using it as treatment. And many people um, who come in with sexual assault will actually get plan B as contraception after their event. So the chance of actually becoming pregnant while using dolutegravir as part of PEP is very, very unlikely. And so many um, centers, including our own, has moved back towards TDF-FTC plus dolutegravir for virtually all people who come in for PEP. Okay, so people may be wondering what about some of the newest and more popular antiretroviral agents that are used for treatment? What about using those for PEP? And um, if you look at the um, screen here, we're looking at a study that was presented by Ken Mayer, who's one of my colleagues here in Boston about a, a PEP regimen with TAF, FTC, and Bictegravir, an integrase inhibitor used as PEP for 48 patients at Fenway Health, which is a community health center that provides care to sexual and gender minorities and has been doing HIV prevention research for many decades. And the way this study was is, um, this is an opalable study of TAF, FTC, Bictegravir in 48 MSM patients who came in for PEP as part of clinical care, and they were routed to the study. And what they did is they compared the safety and tolerability to some historical PEP studies that have been conducted at Fenway with TDF-FTC plus raltegravir and TDF-FTC elvitegravir and cobacistat. And what they found is that the rates of diarrhea were lower in the TAF-FTC bictegravir versus the historical control regimens. They had lower rates of fatigue, um, nausea and vomiting, headache, dizziness and lightheadedness, and aches and discomfort were also quite low. So overall seemed to be as or better tolerated than the historical regimens, understanding that there are definitely challenges to making comparisons over time in historical populations, but very reassuring data in terms of tolerability. And in terms of completion rates, if you look at the bottom row of the table on the right here, you had 85% of people in the study completing their 28 days of PEP with the new regimen versus historical controls where they had 71% um, with the L-Vitegravir regimen and 57% with the Raltegravir regimen, which was largely from people missing the second daily dose of Raltegravir. So um, overall, it seems like very promising data. Only two people in the Bictegravir arm um, or Bictegravir study 
had elevated LFTs, one had decreased creatinine clearance, and all of these uh, lab-related toxicities normalized after they discontinued NPEP. So overall seems really safe, and we'll see if the guidelines incorporate this kind of regimen in the future, but as yet, it's uh, promising evidence, and we'll see how it affects clinical practice. All right, so we've talked about um, agents that are recommended by CDC for PEP and also some treatment regimens that may be um, explored. What about investigational agents that um, really aren't ready for prescribing but may be exciting in terms of the future of PEP? So this is a, um, a slide looking at a study of a drug called Islatrovir, which is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, which has multiple mechanisms of action as a chain terminating agent. And it has a very long half-life, which may be promising for chemoprophylaxis as PEP or even PrEP, as we'll talk about. This is a study with 12 macaques. So it's a, a monkey, studle, monkey um, study where they challenged the monkeys with an IV challenge of a simian immunodeficiency virus. And they tried to see if this latrovir, given at 24 hours after an IV challenge with this virus, could lead to decreases in SIV acquisition. So um, they had a couple regimens. They gave p the monkeys either a single pill um, 24 hours after and left it at one dose, or they gave another dose a week later, or they gave three weekly doses or four weekly doses. And these data here are shown for the two weekly doses. And as you can see from um, the chart here, each of these colorful lines represents an untreated monkey who became infected upon challenge with the SIV virus. And all of them were infected by two weeks. But six of six animals who got either two, three, or four weekly doses with the Islatrovir ended up not getting infected, so were fully protected. So this is promising data that maybe something with a long half-life can be given just um, on a weekly basis. And if you look at the next um, slide here, the investigators who were looking at, at Islatrovir also did something which was really helpful. They did a pharmacokinetic modeling study. What they found is that even a single dose of the aslatrovir given within 24 hours of a challenge as PEP is likely to provide drug levels that are above the lowest aslatrovir levels observed in the monkeys who were fully protected with the two weekly doses, meaning that the pharmacokinetic suggests that even a single dose of PEP taken within 24 hours after exposure may be sufficient to cover the entire PrEP, uh, excuse me, the entire PEP regimen period of 28 days, which would be really exciting because one of the challenges with PEP is having people remain in care and take all their doses. So we'll see if these early phase studies lead to promising later phase studies with this latrovir. And speaking of these challenges with people completing a full PEP course, the WHO has acknowledged that this is a major um, challenge for maximizing the effectiveness of PEP in care settings. And so they did a systematic review a few years ago, looking at over 50 studies and 11,000 plus PEP initiations to see if there were different rates of refusal of PEP of people who were offered a partial course of PEP versus a full course of PEP right up front. So for example, in our hospital, if you come into the emergency department and you've had an exposure and you're looking for PEP, you'll get a four-day starter pack and then you'll be starter pack and you'll be referred to the infectious diseases clinic to see a specialist to get the remaining 24 pills as a prescription to complete your PEP course. But a lot of people don't end up com um, completing that first visit because it takes another referral. It's several days later. There's a lot of stress around the initial exposure events for many people. So there are a lot um, that are lost to follow up. So what they found in this um, meta-analysis systematic review is that people who had a partial course of um, PEP, like a starter pack, only about 22% um, ended up um, refusing PEP, but for people who were given the full course, only 11% ended up refusing PEP. So about twice as many people accepted PEP if they were given it all upfront and not asked to um, have an interim visit. If you go down to the bottom of the table on the right here, you can look at the completion rates for PEP. So people who had a partial course given had a completion rate of 53% versus 70% for people who had the full course up front. So um, these are relatively low quality of evidence according to the WHO review, but I think it does speak to the fact that when possible, giving people all of their PEP um, tablets up front is a good strategy because even if they're lost to follow up, 
if they're able to take the medications and complete the course, they'll get the benefit of chemoprophylaxis as opposed to people who might just get several pills as a bridge to a clinic visit and then never show up. And then they've only gotten four doses or so and the benefits of PEP are therefore lost. Okay, so that was a review of some of the um, evidence of why we think PEP works, some of the trends in its use and also some um, exciting new agents that hopefully would be available in the future for PEP. Now we're gonna shift to talking about PrEP. And as I said before, um, PrEP has been around for a much shorter time than PEP. PEP, um, PrEP studies uh, were first published about 10 years ago, but there are uh, massive amounts of randomized prospective gold standard data showing that PrEP um, works, and it works in multiple populations, including men of sex with men, serial different couples, people who inject drugs, and transgender people, all priority populations for HIV prevention. So let's dig in a little bit more to why PrEP is such an important part of the armamentarium for combating the HIV epidemic. So I was mentioning that there are some great studies showing that PrEP works in randomized controlled trials, but what about in care settings? There was a really impressive study from Kaiser Permanente in Northern California a few years ago, where um, they looked at people who were getting um, PrEP as part of routine care. And they looked at the first 5,104 person years of PrEP use. They had many um, MSM in the Bay Area of San Francisco who were early adopters of PrEP who came in to use it. And this population over the observation period of 5,000 person years, about 40 plus percent of the um, men ended up having and um, some kind of bacterial STI, whether chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis. So very high rates of STIs. About a quarter had a rectal STI, which we know from historical epidemiologic studies is a strong predictor of HIV acquisition. And about 7% had syphilis, another strong predictor of HIV infection. But despite very high rates of bacterial STIs, zero people in this cohort actually acquired HIV. Now it's not a randomized controlled trial. And so there are a lot of caveats that come with observational studies, but this was a really dramatic study showing how incredibly effective PrEP can be if people are motivated and engaged in care, even if they are encountering bacterial STIs that in the pre-PrEP era would have led to a lot of new HIV infections. The CDC estimates there are over a million Americans who are likely to benefit from using PrEP including over 800,000 MSM, 72,000 people who inject drugs, and over a quarter of a million people who identify as heterosexual. And for all these populations, there's a disproportionately high burden of new infections in terms of black populations and Latinx populations. And so accordingly, the CDC thinks that we should have increased prescribing of PrEP to those populations. But in fact, data as of 2018 shows that fewer than 250,000 people have ever been prescribed PrEP in the United States, many of whom have discontinued it. So we are far below scale in terms of the 1.1 million Americans that are likely to benefit from PrEP. And so we need to have much more intensive ways of implementing the strategy in clinical care settings. And unfortunately, PrEP is also used least by those who could benefit most. Data from CDC and some modeling projections, projections suggest that African-American MSM in the US have a lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis as high as one in two, that is in the absence of effective prevention interventions. So we hope this will never come to pass. For Hispanic MSM, the estimate was one in four and for white MSM, it's one in 11. So these dramatic numbers, unfortunately, um, are paradoxical on the rates of PrEP coverage that we see with only 6% of black MSM having um, accessed PrEP, 11% of Hispanic MSM having accessed PrEP, and less than half of white MSM. So again, we need to really think about equitable implementation of PrEP at, at scale to um, not only combat numbers of new infections in the US, but also the grave inequities that have been present for many years. And the barriers to PrEP implementation include stigma and racism in communities. There's a lot of HIV and PrEP related stigma. And there's also uh, racism in terms of non-judgmental, excuse me, in terms of judgmental care that's provided to people who may come in at, looking to access PrEP um, from medical providers. So we need to think a lot about how to reduce these barriers. Cost can also be a barrier. The medication for PrEP is very expensive, so people need insurance support or patient assistance programs. And there are some excellent, robust programs out there, but copays for things like lab tests can also be a big barrier. So we have to think about mitigating costs as well.
HIV risk assessment is another challenge where a lot of patients and providers may not realize that particular individuals are at high enough risk for HIV acquisition to merit PrEP. So we need to think about educating people to think about PrEP for a broad uh, segment of the population who's likely to benefit as CDC has suggested in their estimates. There are also some important gender inequities in that very few PrEP users in the US thus far have been women. This was a study that came out in JAMA just a few weeks ago, looking at almost 50 million commercially insured people in the US. And they used prescription information on 47,000 PrEP users between 2012 to 2018 to look at the gender breakdown and age breakdown of PrEP prescriptions in the US over time. And if you see the chart to the right, in almost every age range, except for adolescent minors, rates of PrEP prescriptions have gone up over time, which is great, even though we're not quite at scale. But when you dig down to the deeper the data more deeply, the investigators who reported this showed that 95% of all the prescriptions in the US were for men. And so largely probably men who have sex with men based on the early adopter studies that we've seen so far, such as from Kaiser, but only 5% in women. And we know that 19% of new HIV infections in the US in 2018 occurred in um, cisgender women. So we have a, a major inequity to overcome in terms of implementing PrEP in that population as well. Similarly, there are inequities with very low rates of PrEP prescribing for people who inject drugs as their major risk of HIV acquisition. So we need to do more for equitable PrEP provision. Okay, let's jump to another uh, question for you all to ponder. A 55-year-old transgender woman requests PrEP. She has condomal sex with men about one to two times per month. She has a BMI or body mass index of 33, hyperlipidemia and hypertension. Which PrEP regimen would you recommend? And let's say that um, for the sake of this uh, question, uh, she has a normal renal function. Would you recommend daily TDF FTC, daily TAF FTC, on-demand TDF FTC or on-demand TAF FTC, where on-demand is taking PrEP? just around the time of sexual contact. Okay, great. So again, we have a broad distribution of answers here, which shows that it's good we're having this conversation. So about half of the people said daily TDF FTC, 23% said daily TAF FTC, 22% on-demand TDF-FTC and 5% on-demand TAF-FTC. So all across the board. So um, walking through the results here, in terms of daily TDF-FTC, that's the regimen that has the, the biggest track record in terms of randomized controlled trial studies. And um, um, that's definitely something that the CDC recommends as the actually the only regimen recommended um, by the CDC thus far. So that's definitely a right answer for anyone who comes in who might benefit from PrEP. Daily TAF FTC, the guidelines don't mention anything about TAF FTC. The guidelines are a few years old, but there's been a recent study looking at TAF FTC for MSM and transgender women that we'll talk about in a moment that showed that TAF FTC was non-inferior for PrEP as compared to TDF FTC. So in fact, that also would be an evidence-based option for this transgender woman, even though the CDC guidelines haven't yet caught up to the data. So I think one and two are both good options. Now you may um, think, well, this person has a high BMI and hyperlipidemia, and it turns out that TDF FTC is uh, very friendly in terms of weight and lipids, but there have been some uh, reports of slight decreases in renal function with TDF-based PrEP as it is with HIV treatment. And so if someone has hypertension and um, age over 50, you might be a little bit more cautious about using TDF, even though I told you this person has normal renal function, so it would actually be a very reasonable option. TAF FTC is a little bit less friendly in terms of weight, as we'll talk about, and in terms of lipids, but is quite friendly in terms of impact on creatinine clearance and renal function. So you can kind of weigh and balance these different options and both would be appropriate. In terms of on-demand TDF-FTC or option three, 
the only on-demand PrEP studies that have been done have been done with MSM. So none have been done with transgender women or other populations. So right now there's no evidence and no guideline statements suggesting on-demand TDF-FTC for transgender women. So that would be getting ahead of the data and the guidelines. And there are no studies of on-demand TAF-FTC for any population at this point. So that would also be getting way ahead of the data and the guidelines. And so probably um, too premature to answer three and four. Okay, so let's dig in a little deeper to the primary data here and see if you agree with uh, what we've been saying. So looking at the DISCOVER study, which was the non-inferiority study of TAF-FTC as compared to TDF-FTC in 5,400 men and transgender women at increased risk for HIV acquisition, they found that there were seven um, uh, infections in the FTAF, as they called it, which is the uh, TAF-FTC arm, and there were 15 in the FTDF arm in this study. And the follow-up was at least one year and two years for half the participants in the study. So they had a good bit of time of follow-up. If you look more closely on the left here at these two bar charts, you can see that, look at the FTAF bar, the solid bar at the bottom are number of people who acquired um, HIV before they actually entered the study, but they were actually in the window period when they entered the study. So no one knew they had HIV when they um, were given PrEP. So for people who acquired HIV and were um, already HIV infected, of course, PrEP cannot prevent HIV acquisition that's already occurring. So um, it's important to consider those numbers in both the FTAF and the FTDF um, arms here. And you can see there was four people in the FTDF arm who were in that situation where they already had HIV when they were given PrEP. The hatch bars in both of these um, columns are people who had suboptimal adherence to the PrEP regimen that they were given which was measured by testing their blood for um, levels of byproducts of the medications. And so again, if they're suboptimally adherent, it's challenging to get full protection from PrEP. So there's only actually one person in each of the two arms, which is indicated by the solid bars at the top of these bar charts that actually had what would be considered a biomedical failure where they had high levels of drug, but they still acquired HIV. So one in the FTAF and one in the FTDF arm. So it speaks to the fact that both of these were highly effective regimens and they were quite similar in their efficacy. If you look to the right, we see a chart of the resistance to study drugs that was detected. And in the FTDF arm, there were four people who had resistance to FTC. All four of these were people who actually were, were HIV infected before they entered the study, but no one knew it. And so that's kind of a perfect storm for generating resistance to a PrEP agent when you might have a high viral load from acute HIV and you're starting just two drugs in terms of your antiretroviral regimen. So that's not surprising. But there were no people in either study arm who acquired HIV after they entered the study and were given PrEP. So that was um, reassuring that we're not gonna see a lot of resistance from PrEP, although some of the people might've been suboptimally adherent, which limits selection pressure for resistance. So we still need more data from real world use of these two agents to know about resistance. But the uh, DISCOVER study here was quite reassuring in that regard. What about the safety of these two agents? So it turns out from the study, they had um, excellent safety profiles for both agents, but they had slightly differing safety profiles. On the left here, you can see trends in creatinine clearance over the first 48 weeks of the study. And the blue bars are for the FTAF group. <clears throat> so the baseline creatinine clearance was 123 milliliters per minute, which is a very normal creatinine clearance. And by the end of the first year, that went up by about 1.8, um, so around 125. In the FTDF arm, there was a slight decrease of about 2.3 mLs per minute, so from 121 to 119. So the punchline here is that even though there was a statistically significant difference in creatinine clearance changes in the two arms, both of these um, populations ended up with very high normal um, um, creatinine clearances. And so there were really no signals of serious renal harms. And in fact, there were no differences in rates of having to discontinue PrEP in either study drug arm because of a renal adverse effect. So that was very reassuring. If you go to the right-hand part of the slide, you can see that there were differences in weight changes. The green bars represent FTAF and the gray bars are FTDF. So over the 48 weeks of the DISCOVER study, people in the FTAF arm gained on average one kilogram or about 2.2 pounds more than people in the FTDF arm. So for people who might have renal issues, you might favor 
FTAF. For people who are worried about weight changes, you might favor FTDF. I'm having trouble advancing the slides here. Okay, great. So in terms of um, lipids, in the Discover study, the FTDF arm had a slightly friendly, friendlier lipid profile. If you look at the left-hand part of these um, bar graphs, you can see the gray is FTDF. You had a decrease in total cholesterol, about 11 points in people who were given FTDF versus a decrease of one point in people given the FTAF. And if you look at LDL, LDL increased a little bit with FT, FTAF and uh, went down by seven points with FTDF. And if you skip over to triglycerides, there was an increase in triglycerides with FTAF and no change with FTDF. So overall, it looks like if you're worried about um, dyslipidemia, FTDF would be a slightly preferable option. In terms of bone mineral density changes, which we know from people using TDF um, for HIV treatment can lead to changes in um, bone mineral density over many years of use. They looked at that with DEXA scans in the DISCOVER study as well. And so in the FTAF group, there was a slight increase in the bone mineral density at the hip position over the first year of the study and a slight decrease in the um, bone mineral density in people given FTDF. So again, these are very small changes and there were no differences in fracture rates in DISCOVER in either of the two study drug arms. So. Uh, the punchline here is if someone had a high risk for osteoporosis or known osteoporosis or osteopenia, then you would favor FTAF. But otherwise, um, these two agents seem to be very safe across the board. All right, so in the case we talked about on demand as a PrEP regimen for MSM, and uh, let me talk a little bit about the data behind that. There's some really striking data from a study called the Ypergay study, which randomized MSM to either what's called a 2 one run regimen of PrEP or a placebo. And with the 2 one one people were told to take two tablets of TDF-FTC between zero and two hours before sex, and then another dose 24 hours afterwards, and then finally another dose 24 hours after that. Hence the two pills, one pill, one pill, or 2 one one And if people had uh, ongoing sexual contacts for more than one day, they were told to take a single daily dose until they stopped having sex and then take another postcoital dose 24 hours later to bracket the PEP course. So these graphics show the two-on-one regimen in those two scenarios. And what the Ypergay study showed in this RCT was that this approach uh, decreased HIV acquisition events by 97% in a study of over 300 MSM in um, parts of Europe and Canada. So it was really a home run study for this population. And so if people are having um, intermittent sexual exposures, this might be a great regimen. Although in the study, people ended up having a lot of sexual contacts and using about 15 or so tablets a month. So it started to look like they were taking close to daily PrEP um, with suboptimal adherence. So it remains to be seen if people have truly intermittent exposures, whether um, this approach will be effective. But there's some reassuring data coming out from the same group that did Ypergay and something called the Prevenir, which is an open label study of 211 versus daily prep, where people could choose if they wanna do daily or on-demand prep. And these were over um, 2000 MSM patients and then an interim analysis presented at the AIDS conference in 2019, about half of the people had chosen on-demand and half had choos chosen the 211 approach and they had no infections in the, the daily PrEP arm and two infections in the on-demand PrEP arm. So both seemed to be highly effective. And uh, using modeling, they estimated they had advert, uh, averted over 140 new HIV infections between these two strategies. So um, this is a really uh, exciting data and it hasn't been fully published yet, but it seems like two and one is gonna be something that is really effective for MSM, but it hasn't been studied in other populations yet. Okay, so in terms of investigational products for PEP, we talked about is Latrivir. What about for PrEP? Well, there's a really exciting study presented this summer called HP10083. And this was a study where they randomized in a blinded fashion, um, several thousand um, MSM and transgender women to either get an injection of a long acting integrase inhibitor called cabotegravir versus taking daily oral TDF-FTC. 
and the injections were given every eight weeks. And the idea here was if people don't want or are unable to take a daily pill, maybe coming in for an injection on a bi-monthly basis and getting protection in between the injections would be a more advantageous strategy. So in this study, which was actually a non-inferiority study, they had 52 HIV infections and over 6,000 person years of follow-up. This is a big study in multiple countries and continents. And what they found is that there were 13 infections in the cabotegravir arm and 39 in the daily oral TFFTC arm. So both um, decreased HIV incidence compared to background rates quite substantially. But in fact, cabotegravir was statistically superior, not just non-inferior, but actually superior to oral TDF-FTC. So the bottom line here is that it seemed like a very promising agent in terms of efficacy, um, even though the um, oral option, which has been uh, tried and true, also was quite effective in this study. So one of the things about getting injections, and some people might have injection site reactions, and in the HBTN OE3 study, they found that 2.2% of people who got the cabotegravir injections ended up permanently discontinuing the study drug due to injection-related adverse events. So this suggests that for most people, the injections will be something that they can tolerate. But for a small number of people, this might be a reason that um, they're unable to tolerate bimonthly injections and would prefer something like taking daily pills. In terms of the safety of the two agents, both agents were uh, really, really safe. Um, there were no differences in uh, serious adverse events in the two groups. And looking at a compilation of grade two plus adverse events, there were some um, subtle differences that I'll mention here. There were slightly higher rates of creatinine clearance clearance um, um, decreases in the TDF-FTC arm, which is consistent with what we know about TDF from other studies um, as compared to the cabotegravir arm. There were slightly higher rates of nasopharyngitis in the cabotegravir arm for reasons that are not clear. There were also higher rates of increases in blood glucose in the cabotegravir arm as compared to TDF-FTC. So there may be some metabolic side effects from the agent that need to be explored. And there were higher rates of pyrexia or fever in the cabotegravir arm as compared to TDF-FTC. Most of those um, episodes of pyrexia occurred shortly after the injections, which suggests they might be related to the injections themselves. So overall, there are some subtle differences that again, need to be explored in um, future studies, but both of them seem to be quite safe and of course, very effective. They also saw that there was about a one kilogram difference in weight gain in the cabotegravir arm versus the TDF-FTC arm. So kind of reminiscent of what was seen in the DISCOVER study for TAF-FTC versus TDF-FTC. Those um, weight differential occurred mostly in the first year of the study. And then afterwards, there seemed to be more parallel changes in weight. So it didn't seem to be a yawning gap in terms of weight over time. But again, more changes, uh, more, more data needed to know if these changes are clinically significant over time. There was a preliminary study of the cabotegravir versus placebo called HB10077 that looked at weight gain over 41 weeks and they did not see a, a difference between cabotegravir and placebo. So the issue here may be that it's not that cabotegravir leads to increased weight gain, but maybe TDF-FTC leads to some weight loss, which is a property that many patients will be excited about when thinking about choosing a PrEP option for themselves. Okay, so other investigational products for PrEP um, worth talking about, getting back to is Latrovir. Um, there was a study that looked at whether they implanted, when they implanted this latrovir as a subcutaneous uh, tube, which is something that's been tried and true for contraception for many years, and they left it in for three months and then removed it. They looked to see how long they would see what were projected to be protective levels of this latrovir in people's blood. And what this pharmacokinetic study showed that with this strategy, they actually saw protective levels well over a year after removing the implants, out to 16 months. So what this suggests is if this ends up being a promising agent in later phase studies, there might be an option of people putting an implant in for three months and then removing it and getting a protectionist prep for an entire year thereafter. So we'll see what later phase studies show for this strategy. Okay, there are some other additional investigational options that um, might prove fruitful. There were two studies in Africa of women who used 
intravaginal rings that eluded a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor called the pivirine. And these showed a modest HIV prevention efficacy in these two studies. And the European medicine agencies, which is the regulatory body in Europe, has actually given a favorable early um, decision about the request for making these available for prescribing. So we'll see if that moves forward. And then maybe in the next year or two, we'll have some movement towards an FDA application. And so there's some um, possibility that this could be available in the US at some point in the future as well. There are also studies looking at infusions every eight weeks of a broadly neutralizing anti-HIV antibody, a monoclonal antibody. And a study called the AMP study is a placebo controlled trial for MSM and transgender women that hopefully will have some results in the near future to tell us whether this strategy, which also would um, abrogate the need to take daily pills is also promising. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I just wanted to briefly talk about the impact that the pandemic has had on PrEP prescriptions at Fenway, um, where I mentioned before is a place where they do a lot of HIV prevention work, including clinical care. And what we found is um, in Boston, the pandemic really hit hard in terms of COVID-19 in March of 2020. And um, in terms of PrEP refill lapses where people might not get another refill when their PrEP pills run out, we saw pretty steady levels throughout January and February. But then when the pandemic hit, we saw an increase of 191%. So many people were not getting refills on their PrEP prescriptions after COVID hit. We also saw a decrease in new PrEP starts from 122 at the health center in January down to only 34 in April, so a decrease in 72%. So in addition to challenges of adherence and persistent with PrEP, COVID-19 has complicated everything by making it more challenging to access PrEP refills. And some people may also have changes in their sexual behaviors and reasons that they may not be accessing PrEP because they don't think they're going to benefit from it during COVID-19. So a lot more data needed to understand the implications of the pandemic on PrEP and its effectiveness. Okay, so we've talked a lot about PEP and PrEP, and now we're gonna talk about the PEP to PrEP transition. There's much more limited evidence about the PEP to PrEP transition, but there was a great study that came out from Canada this summer, looking at a nurse-led PEP and daily PrEP program. And with this program, what they did is they actually had people come in for PEP this is almost all MSM seen in their clinic. And at the very first PEP visit, they would talk about PrEP and offer it. And if people um, didn't want to um, accept PrEP at that visit, they brought it up again at the day 21, which is their first um, PEP fault visit, and um, let them know that they could access PrEP at any time in the future thereafter. And then if they accepted um, PrEP, they would transition immediately from PEP right into PrEP without any break in the action at around day 28. And then they would go on to have an every three month follow-up, which is standard for PrEP care. So what they found in their clinic is that 61 patients requested PEP over the course of about a 15 month follow-up period in 2019. And 61% of these initiated PEP. And of those, 81% agreed to try PrEP. And of those, 85% actually started PrEP immediately. So they had really great rates of people transitioning from PEP right into PrEP when it was mentioned at the beginning of PEP care. So it's an important strategy to keep in mind. But only 27% of people who started PrEP ending up completed their fifth visit of PrEP follow-up. So a lot of people were lost to follow-up in terms of their PrEP care. Now their serial conversion rate for HIV was almost 2% before this PEP to PrEP program and they had no infections after. So um, they argued that they were actually retaining in PrEP care people who were at highest risk. And this is a great proof of concept study for this strategy. I think it's very promising data, but we don't know a lot about people who were lost to follow up. Um, and so bigger studies with this strategy would be welcome, but I think it's quite promising. In New York City, which has a large set of sexual health clinics, they've also looked at their PEP to PrEP um, transition care cascades. And they published a study in JAIDS earlier this year of over 2,000 MSM from 2017 to 2018. And if you look at the red box I put over the um, bar charts here, it looked at people who came in either with PEP or who had a bacterial STI or had an HIV diagnosed partner or who came in just asking about PrEP. And they wanted to see for these different high priority PrEP populations, what their cascades of care looked like for people transitioning towards PrEP. So in the red box, you can see people who came in for PEP. There were 380 PEP patients. And if you look at the cascade of who was offered PrEP navigation, then accepted PrEP navigation, received PrEP navigation, 
were referred to a PrEP facility and then actually prescribed PrEP, only 18 of 381 patients on PEP ended up getting a PrEP prescription. So it's an incredibly um, big challenge in terms of their cascade of PEP care. They saw similar cascades for people who came in with an STI, an HIV diagnosed partner, or who came in just asking about PrEP. So the punchline here is we really need to have more rigorous and intensive ways to keep people engaged in chemo prophylaxis, particularly when they come in and they've used PEP, how do we get them transitioning right to PrEP without being lost to follow up? Okay, so here's what the CDC guideline says about the um, PEP to PrEP transition. They say we should offer PrEP after PEP for anyone who has frequent or recurrent HIV exposures, anyone who has had a history of repeated courses of PEP, or if they request PrEP, but they're still in the 72 hour window where they should get PEP first, they should be offered PrEP right after. And the CDC recommends an immediate transition from PEP to PrEP without delay, because this can maintain high levels of antiretroviral drug levels for PrEP, and it will also maximize continuous prevention measures. So we know that a lot of people will be lost to care if we ask them to go home and come back in a month to talk about PrEP. So they um, recommend strongly that people just remain right in chemoprophylaxis care and transition from PEP to PrEP. Here's a bit of a flowchart I created based on the CDC PrEP guidelines about what you would do at day 28. On day 28, you would assess for signs and symptoms of acute HIV and um, repeat a rapid HIV test. If there are any signs or symptoms of acute HIV or the rapid test is positive at the end of their PEP course, you would send a confirmatory test and continue their three drug and PEP regimen because you haven't fully ruled out acute HIV. And if their um, confirmatory test is positive, refer them to full HIV care. If the confirmatory test is negative or the rapid test and symptom screen were negative, you can stop the third drug at day 28, continue PrEP and then complete any needed baseline labs that weren't done as part of PEP that are needed for PrEP. This is a helpful flow chart to think about what you do at the end of the PEP care when you transition to PrEP. One challenge with the PEP to PrEP transition is that people may have suppressed viral load if they do acquire HIV when they're using PEP, and they may also have delayed seroconversion. So it may be challenging in terms of people who are using chemoprophylaxis to actually detect that they've acquired HIV using routine methods. So these are some study, not from a PEP study, but actually from a PrEP study called the Partners PrEP study, which was a large RCT of PrEP in Sub-Saharan Africa of HIV zero discordant couples. And what they found is that people who acquired HIV who were using PrEP, 11% had an undetectable HIV viral load at seroconversion, whereas only 3% of those in the placebo arm of the study did. So acquiring HIV while you're using chemoprophylaxis can suppress your viral load, even though it's not a full antiretroviral treatment regimen. They also saw a delay in seroconversion. It took 80 days for people on PrEP to have a um, evolution of their antibody response versus only 49 days in people in placebo. And if you look at the chart to the right here, on the vertical axis are the days between someone's first HIV positive test and when their monthly third generation antibody test became positive. And the red line was at 100 days. People in the placebo arm on the left there, almost everyone had a detectable third generation antibody test within 100 days of their HIV seroconversion event. Only a small number of people ended up um, having a positive HIV antibody test thereafter. Um, in terms of people in the next group, these were people who were assigned to PrEP but didn't take the medications. They were effectively getting no PrEP. And they also saw um, that most people had a very rapid seroconversion. But in the far right part of this chart, people who actually used PrEP and had high levels of tenofovir there, was, um, there were a number of people who didn't have a positive antibody test until well after 100 days, even as long as 450 days out. So again, this suggests if you're a clinician and you're trying to transition someone from PEP to PrEP, if we see the same kind of um, delayed seroconversion with PEP, which you might expect, there are gonna be some challenges in making sure that you fully ruled out HIV acquisition as part of the PrEP care. So what are the implications for HIV testing on, uh, for people who use PEP or PrEP? Well, using a fourth generation antibody antigen test, which is more sensitive than the third gen test that we use in the partner's PrEP study is going to be advantageous. And that's what CDC recommends. So oral tests and um, third gen tests are not gonna be as useful. The HIV viral load as a diagnostic test may also be inadequate to rule in or rule out HIV because you may have false negatives if people have a suppressed viral load while they're using PEP or PrEP. 
So you may need to think about using more sensitive um, RNA tests, like an HIV RNA qualitative test. Or rarely, there have been a couple cases with a lot of discordant results where it was tricky for clinicians to figure out if people were infected or not. And they've had to use research-based tests, such as looking for cell-associated HIV-1 RNA or DNA. So again, there could be some um, real challenges in making sure that you definitively rule out HIV acquisition as part of the PEP to PrEP transition. Okay, last audience response question in the um, body of the presentation here. A 33-year-old cisgender man with opioid use disorder shares syringes with partners of unknown HIV status and exchanges sex for drugs on occasion. He injects multiple times each day on many days. Last was four days ago. He and you agree on starting PrEP. What is your approach? Would you send a fourth gen test now and have him return in four weeks to start uh, TDFFTC as PrEP if he tests negative now and again at four weeks? Would you send the fourth gen test now and have him return in another week instead of four weeks to have another um, fourth gen test and start um, PrEP then if the second test is negative? Would you send a fourth gen test now and just start TDFFTC right away and just call him to discontinue PrEP if the test comes back positive? Or would you send a fourth gen test, um, start three drugs now, as in TDFFTC Vilpivirine, which is a single tablet three drug regimen, and then just drop the third drug towards uh, PrEP if the test is negative now and again at four weeks. And this is a very advanced um, case, I would say, with uh, a lot of gray zones coming into play here. Okay, so um, we have the um, only 5% of people chose option one, 10% option two, 46% said option three, and 39% said option four. So again, no real consensus. And I don't think there's a right answer here, but walking through the options, I think option one, the challenge here is about the window period. The fourth gen test has a window period where you might have false negatives for about two to three weeks. So coming back in four weeks to get another fourth gen test would actually help you definitively rule out HIV infection, but that's only if he didn't have ongoing exposures in the middle. But if he's injecting frequently, you may never get out of the window period with option one. With option two, you'd get out of the window period quickly, except both um, a test now and in a week are actually in the window period of the first test. So um, neither of these would actually get you out of the, um, the window period sufficiently to know you've fully ruled out HIV acquisition before starting PrEP. The same thing with option three, where you could have a false negative test. And so if you um, just start PrEP and continue it, and only based on one test, you may be starting PrEP in people who've acquired HIV. So even though there are no guidelines um, and not a lot of data to support this, some colleagues are actually starting to do option four, which I think is actually a, a, a very promising approach where you can start people on a full kind of PEP or treatment regimen right off the bat. And then if people are still negative at four weeks, you can um, transition to two drug PrEP. And the benefits there are that people um, will actually be getting chemoprophylaxis or HIV treatment, and you won't find yourself stuck in a window period where you're actually unable to rule out HIV that's been undiagnosed, but you're only giving people two drug PrEP. Just trying to advance my slides here. Okay, great. So um, this uh, option four, which I think is uh, a promising option is something they do at Boston Medical Center here with a colleague who pr um, pr provides a lot of prep to people who inject drugs and where they have frequent injections, they've used a couple strategies to try and um, have a low barrier uh, bridge clinic for people going from um, not being on any chemoprophylaxis to NPEP and then bridging right into PrEP. And so what they've tried to do is start people on um, this three drug approach with single tab regimens like the one I mentioned, or you could use any of the others that are recommended by the CDC as a way of getting around that um, trick of giving people PrEP when you haven't fully ruled out undiagnosed acute HIV. They also have people come back for weekly refills so that they're not um, having to think in advance 
about how they're going to manage their medications for four weeks, which can be challenging in terms of the psychosocial difficulties in remaining engaged in care for people who have active substance use disorders. And they have very intensive navigation as well, which is good for anyone who's using PEP or PrEP. So I think that um, we don't have a lot of guidance on this use of kind of a three drug regimen as PEP and transitioning right into PrEP in this scenario, but I think it shows a lot of promise. Okay, so why the importance of trying to get people immediately transitioned to PrEP? Well, there was a study from New York City that looked at starting people on PrEP right away called immediate PrEP or delaying PrEP until after their baseline labs came back. And in this study, they had 1400 PrEP candidates who had a negative rapid HIV test. And they just asked them about their kidney disease history, whether they had a history of hepatitis B or signs of acute HIV. If they said no to all these questions, they gave them PrEP right away while their baseline renal function and HIV RNA labs were cooking. And what they found is that 99% of people in this arm were able to continue PrEP and that they had normal renal function and didn't actually have acute HIV. Only four people or far less than 1% had to go back and stop PrEP when the labs came back. In the other arm called the delayed PrEP arm, where they had only 50 people who answered yes to one of those first questions they actually didn't give them PrEP until the labs came back. And for that group, they had seven people or 14% who did have either problems with their renal function or acute HIV or hepatitis B surface antigen positivity. But 86% still were cleared for PrEP after the labs came back, but only 35% of the people in that arm ended up getting a PrEP prescription and starting it. So there was a huge difference in terms of engagement in PrEP care if you had immediate PrEP where people um, started the medication right away versus delaying it until their labs come back. So based on these and similar data, most um, programs are thinking about this idea of immediate or same day PrEP starts. And I think it speaks really highly to the benefits of a PEP to PrEP transition for the same reason of not having people lost to care. So I'm gonna conclude with one more study that looked at a new strategy of PEP called PIP or PEP in pocket. These were two HIV prevention clinics in Toronto where they had MSM come in who had only intermittent exposures. So no more than four exposures per year. And they gave them a prescription for PEP and said, just take it if you have an exposure and then come into the clinic with one week of taking PEP. And they had 75 people over the course of about 15 months who used, um, who got a PIP prescription. Um, only about a quarter of, the, quarter of these people ended up using PIP at all. And what they actually found is that about a quarter of that 75 um, people ended up deciding that they didn't want to keep using PIP, but wanted to start on daily PrEP. So they had people do kind of the PIP to PrEP transition. They also had some people who were on PrEP in their clinic who transitioned to PIP. So um, the, the punchline here is that people may have very different preferences and lifestyles in terms of their exposures, and they want to switch back and forth from daily options to PEP to PIP and all, the, all around the different acronyms to meet their needs. And I think it's really cool and probably is a way to engage as many people in chemo prophylaxis as possible by having these flexible options that um, kind of meet people where they're at for different options. And in this study, all the people who got PIP started um, their PEP regimens within 72 hours after their exposure. And they all had high adherence to the pills and excellent follow-up. And there were no seroconversions after 15 months of follow-up. So it's great proof of concept data that this may be um, an important strategy to integrate into um, chemoprophylaxis care. Okay, so to conclude, PEP and PrEP are both effective tools for HIV prevention. We need strategies to improve the use of PEP and PrEP and also the equitable use of these as we scale these up, including in, in terms of gender inequities and racial and ethnic inequities. All these um, need to be addressed for full-scale effective implementation of PEP and PrEP. Guidelines from CDC recommend the immediate transition from PEP to PrEP, though we know there are many barriers that exist some of the innovative approaches to offering PEP and PrEP, including things like PIP or the PEP to PrEP transition program, might be ways to overcome some of these barriers um, to engage as many people as possible in effective chemoprophylaxis. Okay, so getting back, back to the first post-test question, what do clinical practice guidelines from the US CDC recommend for the PEP to PrEP transition? Is it complete PEP, then wait six months to confirm HIV uninfected status, then start PrEP? Is it complete PEP, then wait three months to confirm uninfected status, then start PrEP? 
is a complete PEP, then confirm status and start PrEP without delay or no recommendation is provided. Okay, so here we have 94% of people chose option three, which is um, consistent with what the CDC guidelines are recommending. And for post-test question two, which innovative approach to PEP has been studied in routine care settings? So the long-acting injectable PEP, uh, PEP in pocket, or prescribing a PEP course for patients to self-administer after potential exposures, a single dose of long-acting oral PEP or infusion of monoclonal antibodies against HIV as PEP. All right, so 81% said um, the PEP in pocket, um, as we just discussed in the last study, um, that's one of the innovative approaches to PEP that's been studied routine care settings, whereas long-acting injectable um, PEP um, has not been studying in care settings, and neither has single dose of long-acting oral PEP or infusion of monoclonal antibodies. Those are all PrEP strategies that we had discussed. Okay, so that concludes our slide presentation, and we're going to transition to the um, Q&A. Please use the Q&A button to submit questions, and I'm going to stop my screen share at this point. Dr. Krakauer, you may review all the questions that we received from the attendees using the Q&A button as well. Okay, thank you, Jose. So the first question, some guidelines started to recommend on-demand dosing for heterosexual men. What is your opinion on that? Well, again, the only data we really have for on-demand dosing is from the Ypergay studies. So I would um, say we really need more um, targeted data. There's every reason to believe it should work in terms of some of the pharmacokinetics, but without definitive data, I think it's getting ahead of what we have in terms of data. The next question, if someone takes 2-1-1 PrEP but takes the two tablets more than 24 hours before sex, but continues to take one tablet every 24 hours, is there any data that this is effective. So the idea here is um, for two and one prep, um, if they started um, well in advance of the first exposure, then it starts to look more like a plain old daily prep. And we know that from um, daily prep where you're starting off with one pill a day instead of two pills all at once, it probably takes about seven days to achieve protective levels for people who have rectal exposures like MSM and um, potentially up to three weeks for people who have vaginal exposures like cisgender women or some transgender men. So people have um, tended to use those seven versus 21 day guidelines. And if you're um, taking the, the double dose even before um, zero to two hours before uh, exposure, you're probably just gonna get there quicker but there aren't great data to know exactly um, how quickly you would. The next question, have you seen anything about ED PrEP users who miss the loading dose or take it too late? Would PEP be the recommendation here? And uh, ED I'm guessing is event driven or sort of the on demand. So if, if people miss the loading dose or take it too late, then we don't have a lot of data suggesting that we know it's protective. The only data we have that are convincing are the two on one. So if you've kind of missed the, um, the loading dose, um, the recommendation would be to presume people have not yet achieved protection and to offer them a full PEP regimen. And then you could transition back into um, either daily PrEP or maybe on-demand PrEP at the end of the, the PEP course. So the next question, at, at Fenway with the drop-in PrEP, PrEP starts and refills, was there a corresponding increase in new HIV infections? So there was actually also a drop in HIV testing by 80% over the course of the pre versus post COVID era, but there were no um, um, changes in HIV infections amongst the PrEP cohort that we followed. The HIV infections are very rare in the PrEP cohort at Fenway. So there was only one infection in January and February in the PrEP cohort, and there were none in March and April. So we didn't see um, an increase in new infections, which is reassuring that um, potentially people were actually not getting their PrEP refilled 
because they weren't engaging in sexual risk behaviors due to social distancing, for example. But we know from other studies that certainly there are many people who are still continuing to engage in um, sexual contacts, um, even though we're in the midst of, of COVID-19. And so it's really gonna be an individualized discussion. So some of the reasons we might not have seen an increase in HIV infections is because HIV testing was also down. So people might've been cautious about coming to get a test. But um, over time, we'll, we'll see whether or not we see a bump in new HIV um, cases over the many months after COVID hit. We haven't seen a bump yet, which is reassuring. Next question, can you address cost effectiveness of generic TDF FTC, also generic TDF plus generic FTC? So there was a great study by Rochelle Walensky and colleagues that looked at the cost effectiveness of TDF FTC versus TAF FTC as daily um, oral prep. And it showed that you really are gonna be hard pressed to find TAF FTC to be cost effective option, given the very small differences in safety profiles um, with the kind of price differential you'd see when there are multiple generic options for TDF FTC on the market. So the first generic TDF FTC just about a week or two ago, I think it was, is actually uh, approved and available um, for hitting the market. So it's usually only after there are multiple generics that you see a substantial price drop. So hopefully in the next six to 12 months, if there are more um, generic options, we will see uh, a decrease in the cost of TDF FTC, which will probably lead to substantial increases in cost effectiveness, which is why many um, experts, including our groups have recommended that TDF FTC remain uh, a first line option to improve access on the population level if its cost effectiveness becomes that much better than TAF, um, TAF FTC, um, acknowledging that there's some people for whom TAF FTC is gonna be safer and a better option if they have, for example, kidney or bone issues. Next question, is there any evidence which supports removing the need for kidney and liver function monitoring at two weeks into the PEP regimen? I think it's a really important question because we haven't seen in PEP studies, you know, many studies showing that there are harms from PEP. And like I showed from the Bictarvi study, people tended to do really well in terms of toxicity monitoring. And so many of us locally have actually tried to decrease the intensity of lab monitoring. The guidelines still mentioned for people who are getting TDF FTC plus an integrase inhibitor to check baseline and then repeat LFTs and renal function at four to six weeks. But I think that over time, I'd be hopeful that there'll be more studies showing that because we have so few um, adverse effects and toxicities from the PEP medications we use nowadays versus you know, 20 years ago, that in fact, we can probably um, decrease the, the lab checking. I think that would be a, a nice way to improve cost effectiveness and also reduce the invasiveness of the, the program for people who are on PEP. Next question, what is the weekly return rate of people who inject drugs being transitioned from PEP to PrEP? So I don't have a, a number uh, off the top of my head. The study I mentioned from Boston Medical Center or that, that approach that they're taking in their program was based on a research letter with not a huge amount of data, but um, we definitely have to think about the, the challenges of people who are engaging in active opioid use to being engaged in care. Now, part of the reason that people were coming back for a weekly follow-up is that they were getting substance use treatment as well on a weekly basis. So in terms of their opioid use disorder treatments, some of those were being administered in a direct fashion on a weekly basis. So that was a reason that people were engaged in their overall preventive health care um, for their addiction. And that was an opportunity to have people come back uh, week after week for, for PrEP. So I think it's still a very attractive option if people have the resources to bring people in on a weekly basis. Next question, is any three drug regimen sufficient for PEP? I was only aware of INSTI-based regimens, specifically Roltegravir and Dolutegravir. So there hasn't been a lot of efficacy data. Most of it's kind of single arm observational work. So no one really knows if um, any one regimen, whether INSTIs or protease inhibitors or NNRTIs are better than another regimen because there really haven't been head-to-head -head efficacy studies. So if you go to the guidelines, as I mentioned, they have some preferred options based on what they presume is um, high efficacy and also high tolerability of INSTI-based regimens. But in fact, you could use virtually anything that you had. There are some things you shouldn't use because they're not safe, like a Bacavir. 
um, or um, nevirapine because there can be toxicities from those medications. But if you look at the guidelines, they provide a lot of options if you don't have access to INSTEs and uh, the basic NRTI backbone, TDFFTC. For question number three, why the choice of rolpivirine as third component instead of an INSTE? And so I'm assuming this is uh, the question uh, where we were talking about a person who is using injection drugs and we recommended that they use PEP. Um, it really could have been any, frankly. Um, in terms of single tablet regimens, the only single tablet regimen with an INSTE right now is Bictegravir with TAF FTC. And because the only data available on that as a PEP regimen is the Fenway study that I mentioned before, uh, it still would be getting a fair bit ahead of the data to um, prescribe it um, as PEP. But you know, I'm hopeful that the study coming out of Fenway will uh, potentially affect the guidelines in the future. But for now, we're all still in the realm of, of uh, evolving evidence. For someone presenting within 72 hours of potential exposure who may have continued exposures while on PEP, can you clarify the strategy to move them to PrEP? Sure, so the idea here is that um, when someone first comes in and they may have frequent exposures, there's a window period. So when you send a fourth generation test, for example, even if it comes back negative, they may actually have undiagnosed acute HIV and you're having a false negative fourth gen test. So by starting them on um, PEP, you can um, uh, make sure that you're not giving them PrEP in the context of undiagnosed acute HIV, which is a perfect storm for resistance to evolve, for example. So in terms of the strategy of moving them to PrEP, the idea would be just like anyone who goes from PEP to PrEP, if after um, they've been on PEP for 28 days, you send another fourth gen test and that comes back negative, then there's a, a very high likelihood that you've um, uh, managed to find someone who did not acquire HIV at the beginning of their PEP course. Now you may be wondering, okay, but if they've had frequent exposures during weeks two, three, four of their PEP course, how can you ever be totally sure that you've ruled out that they've acquired HIV during PEP? And the answer is, well, you can't, but the idea is because they've been getting chemoprophylaxis, it's kind of like they're getting PrEP against additional exposures in weeks two, three, four of their PEP course. So that's why I think you know, many of us feel like this is a great strategy because it combines the benefits of PEP with um, a transition right into PrEP. And really, um, you know, people probably are getting protection from the PrEP aspect of things after a couple of weeks as well. And so even though you can't be 100% sure you haven't missed that they've acquired HIV by the week four period, Remember, you're also gonna bring them in a month later for another HIV fourth gen test, and then every three months thereafter. So you'll have ample um, follow-up if they remain engaged in care, that is, to figure out whether or not they've actually acquired HIV at any point along the way. But this maximizes the um, administration of chemoprophylaxis, which gives them the most preventive health benefits. Next question of 1.1 million estimated needing PrEP, what percent are women and what are strategies to engage them? That's a really important question. And um, if you recall from the slide that I showed, there were about um, 250 plus thousand heterosexuals. And um, because of the rates of, of cisgender women, heterosexual cisgender women who acquire HIV are higher than heterosexual cisgender men, uh, you would see accordingly a larger proportion of those um, being um, PrEP candidates. So like I said during the talk about 19% of new infections in the US occurred among cisgender women in 2018. That's based on the most recent CDC data. And so accordingly, we should see about 20% of PrEP prescriptions in that population. And one of the challenges is that um, women's risk for HIV acquisition may relate more to their uh, male partners HIV risk patterns than their own in the sense of um, they may not know that a male partner, for example, is having sex with other men, and that may be the bridge towards HIV transmission within their relationship. So it's trickier to use risk assessment protocols and uh, tools to identify individual cisgender women who may merit PrEP versus, for example, populations of MSM, where if someone's had syphilis or rectal gonorrhea, we know there's a strong indication for PrEP. So the strategies that some of us are advocating nowadays are 
more along the lines of universal discussions of PrEP with cisgender women. Just the way we talk about contraception with the vast majority of women who come in for routine preventive health care or primary care, we'd like to see that um, be part of the discussion too, where we talk about contraception and also um, PrEP as part of the conversation. That way we might have better luck with women kind of self-identifying that they may benefit from PrEP. It's still a major challenge that a lot of people are investigating ways to overcome though. Any concerns about someone starting PrEP and also has hepatitis B virus and then poor adherence and loss to follow-up? Is there a risk of hepatitis B flare-up? Yes, this is a great question because um, hepatitis B is a virus that tenofovir and emtricitabine are also active against. And if you abruptly discontinue hepatitis B treatment, you can see acute hepatitis flares, which is why the on-demand approaches to um, PrEP are not recommended for people who have chronic active, active hepatitis B, because then you might be um, starting and stopping anti-hepatitis B therapy when you start and stop PrEP therapy. But for people who have Hep B, if they use daily PrEP and they're aware that they need to uh, let their clinicians know when they stop daily PrEP so that they can be monitored for symptoms or potentially monitoring their liver function tests, then you can detect early hepatic flares um, and avert the kind of serious sequelae of undetected hepatitis B flares like hepatic inflammation and very, very rarely uh, acute liver failure. Next question, are there insurance barriers to PEP in pocket? Oh, excellent question. I, I'm not sure. I don't think that there would be in the sense that you're still giving someone a PEP prescription, um, just like you would give them a PEP prescription in, in your clinic. So whatever barriers we've seen with PEP should be the same because they can take the prescription and then just go and fill it. The study that I mentioned where they studied PEP was actually a study in Canada, which has, uh, of course, a different insurance structure than we have in the US. Um, but I really think it's a, a great question. My hunch is that you could probably, um, probably would see just the same, but no more of the barriers that we see with PEP. Has anyone looked at PEP or PIP for transgender women who have only receptive anal intercourse with no, excuse me, neovagina or use of neovagina? Um, it's a, a great question. I haven't seen studies that are, have kind of had that um, level of granularity and focus on trans women who only have receptive anal intercourse. Um, my presumption is that um, you know, many trans women would be having receptive anal intercourse and uh, all the data that we know about PEP and PIP, for example, for MSM um, would probably apply as well, but it's a bit of a data-free zone. I would probably um, you know, march forward though and, and absolutely uh, recommend PEP for trans women who come into care and, and have indications. And by extension, I think PEP probably is something that would work for that population as well. But we'd really welcome more studies um, in diverse populations besides the only PIP study we, which we have now from Toronto. How many days should one take the daily PrEP following the last exposure? So uh, not a lot of great data to guide this. Um, most people would recommend um, taking daily prep for at least a couple of weeks after <clears throat> you need the last exposure. And the theory here is that you probably have a washout period where you still have um, some prep around in your system, and in which case you'd be getting chemoprophylactic protection. But that doesn't last most likely more than a week or two, maybe three. But pharmacokinetic studies would suggest you shouldn't really rely on it more than the order of several days or a week. So by taking um, several weeks of PrEP after last exposure, it's kind of like thinking of it as a PEP uh, scenario where you're continuing chemoprophylaxis for a few weeks thereafter to try and avert the establishment of infection. So um, I would recommend something like two to four weeks after your last exposure if possible. For MSM, couldn't you offer on-demand PrEP rather than PIP? Would PIP just be in case the pre-sex doses of on-demand PrEP were missed and for uh, people who inject drugs, women, et cetera? So yes, you absolutely could offer on-demand PrEP rather than PIP. This is really going to be um, about people's preferences. If they're able to plan ahead in terms of their sexual contacts and take the on-demand um, regimen beforehand, then I think on-demand PrEP is a great one for, for MSM. If they can't remember or they have incidents where um, they have forgotten to, then having the um, PEP on hand for the PIP approach, I think is a, a good approach as well. And of course, because I mentioned before, there aren't any on-demand studies in other populations besides MSM. 
um, you really only have the PEP and, and PIP approaches for those populations. Now you could also say, well, we really don't have, we don't have data on PIP in other populations besides that one study from Toronto, which would absolutely be true as well. But in terms of the, the biomedical properties of PEP, um, you know, we, we know how it's recommended to be used for populations as routine administration for PEP. So I would just simply say that um, if we can extend that to the PIP case, as long as people can be engaged in taking the pills within 72 hours after exposure and then come into care within a week um, as recommended. So more of an implementation series of studies that I think really need to be needed to extend the PIP approach to new populations. Um, can I use FTC TAF 200 slash 10 milligrams as PrEP? So you have basically the standard um, uh, dosing of um, TAF FTC is what's been studied for PrEP. And for the populations that I mentioned, MSM and transgender women, that would be um, reasonable. The FDA did not approve the use of TAF FTC for PrEP amongst people who have receptive vaginal intercourse as a potential exposure route for HIV based on the fact that Discover did not enroll any cisgender women or transgender men. So um, that's the caveat to using TAF-based regimens as PrEP. It's only for populations that have been approved by FDA at this point. There is a study that's um, hopefully being started soon that's looking at TAF-FTC as daily PrEP for cisgender women. Um, and hopefully in the next few years then we'll have robust data on that population as well. Next question, if PrEP is not initiated after a PEP course, when is recommended to perform a fourth gen HIV test to rule out HIV infection? So according to the PEP guidelines, um, the recommendation is to do an HIV fourth gen at the start of PEP, which isn't really telling you if they've acquired HIV from the exposure that led to the PEP prescription, but rather where they had already previously been um, HIV infected. But then the recommendation is to do another fourth gen test at four to six weeks. So basically at the end 